Don't Let Me Die, The Hyler Chronicles, by Charles Shepard, and edited by John Moniz. Chapter 1. Baseball Blunder. Please, Sheriff, have mercy on us. We've obeyed the law since the days of its inception. My chest hurts, Coach groaned. I think I'm dying. Hang in there, Coach. The Reapers will be here in a few seconds. Matter of fact, they should be here now. They'll take care of you as soon as they get here, said the sheriff. The Reaper Patrol? They are the worst thing our government has created. They're terrible. They claim to be for the people, but are not. They are just another government scam. Let me go, cried Miss Adams. Miss Adams, I already told you, but I'm not letting you go. This is for your own good. Now calm down and let me do my job replied the sheriff. He continued while holding her. Miss Adams, the Reaper Patrol is an unfortunate byproduct of a problem with overpopulation. Miss Adams continued to cry and tried to wriggle free from his grasp. As I watched her, I began to feel very uneasy. I felt like knocking the sheriff to the ground, while another part of me wanted to hold Miss Adams so that, so that she would not break the law by going to her husband. I felt torn inside but thought better of it because we had been taught to conceal our emotions in situations such as these. My teammates seemed stunned by what they had witnessed. The last time that I saw a pain of that magnitude was the day my dad and I were in the city. Since then, the government put strict regulations on those going into and coming out of the city. At least that's what we were here around town. It's all very hush-hush. Nobody knows for sure, and you're not su supposed to talk about it. Maybe the townspeople weren't afraid of the horrible stories at all. Maybe they were just afraid of the government. The government was for the people, and run by the people. What was there to fear? I knew enough to know that the youth was not a guarantee against fear and uncertainty about the future. I'll probably end up working on the farm, a harsh thought. But what seemed harsh to me did, did not even compare with what Coach and Miss Adams had to face. I thought they had a reason to want to hold each other one last time. I struggled with my thoughts. I've got to get a hold of myself. I must conceal my emotions and suppress them. How could I forget overpopulation? I was young and had lived through the worst of it, said Miss Adams. I had dreams of changing the world. I saw my own brother wither away and die. I'll never forget the years that followed. I worked with various groups to change the government for the better. That may have been a mistake. Our beloved President Harvester ruined it all. Are you calling the government a mistake? Well, I think you and your husband made the mistake by coming to Ripville, said the sheriff, looking anxious as if he wanted this whole thing to be done with as quickly as possible. Hey guys, a Reaper Patrol is coming, exclaimed one of my teammates. A hush fell on the crowd as they saw the van approach. I'm sorry, it's all my fault, gasped Coach as he spoke to his wife, tears streaming down his face. Stop them, cried Miss Adams. I'm sorry to the both of you, replied the sheriff. But no one heard him. All eyes were turned towards the reapers, who descended from the sky in a black fan, and landed in the parking lot that was next to the field. Only government officials, law enforcement, military, the reaper patrol, and the extremely wealthy had access to these flying vehicles. The van had the logo of the Grim Reaper painted on each side to notify all spectators of their presence. On the top back corners of the van were two scythes. The blades of the scythe were on the poles and inverted so as to stand out like emissaries of death. The van also had a bumper that resembled a skull. The windows of the van were tinted black to keep the curious from looking in. It had no lights of any kind and I could only speculate on what would be on the inside of the vehicle. How did they navigate in the dark? I pondered, but came up with nothing. Then the van drove towards the field and came to a halt. My husband is doomed, cried Miss Adams as she sobbed and wailed. My ticker began to beat faster. I felt lightheaded, as if I were going to throw up and pass out. My legs shook. It was my first time seeing these guys since I was seven. I had seen them from a distance and had not been able to witness the outcome. That was seven years earlier and death had not yet become a part of my life. Now I would see the Reaper Patrol in action. We all waited in anticipation for the doors of the van to open. I could tell that my teammates were anxious by the way of some of them were biting their nails. The back doors flew open, and out came the Reapers, one by one. There were three of them, 
Each of them wore a black helmet and mask that hid their face. The mask looked like a silver skull, which gave me goosebumps and made me shiver. They also wore black leather jackets, pants, and gloves that only added to the mystery. But the thing that really made them look Macbury were their black hooded capes. Each of them held a sharp scythe, which made them look like the Green Reaper himself. One of the Reapers pulled the case from the van. Then they walked together towards the dying coach. As they neared, I could see the badges on their chests as they shone in the sun. No one made a sound. The mere sight of the Reapers had paralyzed us all with fear. As I walked past, I got a closer look at the badges. They were triangular in shape, made out of some sort of alloy, and engraved with a name and a number. The first Reaper to walk past, the one who carried the case, had the name Jackal and the number 1301. The second had the name Shadow and the number 1312. While the third had the name Quickblood and the number 1333. Besides the badges, I noticed that each Reaper had a gadget on his wrist. Maybe a watch. It's good that you guys decided to join us. I was beginning to worry. Thought I might have to do the job myself. Said the sheriff who looked relieved. Now, yeah, sheriff, we know we will show them your job. You shouldn't worry. Said Jackal. Well, we're sorry for any inconvenience that we may have caused you, but there are a lot of people in dire need of our services. It's the end of the fall, and we have to bear the face of the dead. Explained Jackal. Yeah, yeah, the cold. I know. Replied the sheriff. Well, you know, sir, we may be monsters, but we are God's things to rest. If you just hear cold, answered Jackal, who put the case down next to Coach. Looks like an easy one, said Quickblade as he watched the crowd. Yeah, said Jackal, who opened his case. People move out. There won't be much left to see after we're done, said Quickblade, who was spinning his scythe in a helicopter like motion, as if he were bored. Come on, people. You heard the man. Let's go and let them do their job, said someone in the crowd. I don't know about you, but I'm not hanging around to see what happens next, Simon exclaimed. I'll see you later. I'm staying to see what they're going to do to Coach. Chris, don't be foolish. I've heard that it will make you sick, said Simon, who looked scared. I want to stay and watch, I said. You shouldn't do that. Listen to me. Why the sudden change? asked Simon. Simon, I know that you have given me good advice in the past, but today I'm listening to me. I feel the urge to watch. I replied, feeling a pull within to stay. An urge? asked Simon, who looked bewildered. Have you gone crazy? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, he said. I want to open my eyes and expose what is going on. I want to know why so many people in this town are walking around with their eyes shut, I replied. I don't think you'll be able to hold back your emotions. I know that we were taught about how to handle this. I just don't think you or I are ready. And you and I have seen death before. It was alright to show our feelings back then. We're teenagers and expected to act like adults. I don't think you're ready for this, explained Simon. You are so wrong, I replied. I am ready. I'm old enough. These people are going to walk away and I suggest that you do the same. Well, I guess I am the one to test the stigma and the rules that we were taught. I shot back. Shut your traps! I've heard enough from you two already, said Shadow. Sorry, sir, said Simon. I was only trying to convince my friend to move along. Sir, don't I have the right to watch? I asked. Depends, answered Quickblade. How old are you? asked Jackal. Fourteen, I said. Your age, said Jackal. Do you think you're ready for this? I nodded. Give me your hand, said Jackal. Scanning my right hand with his watch. You're clear. Kid, you're not gonna make it. You're gonna get sick. If that happens, you can find yourself like a coach. Said Shadow. It rarely ever happens. It's risky. It comes with the territory. Said Jackal, who reached for something in the case. You should be at it. You like the rest of the cows, probably. Trust me, you really don't want to see this. Said Quickblade. Listen to him! Pleaded Simon. Hey! Let him watch, said someone in the crowd. Whatever, let's get back to business, answered Jackal, sounding both irritated and perturbed. Good luck, Chris. I hope to see you later, said Simon as he hurried off. Me too, I muttered under my breath. I understood why he had left. Simon told me that when he was nine, he and his parents were driving home from the fair. 
they had swerved to avoid hitting a dog that had run to the lane. The truck flipped and rolled, landing in an irrigation ditch that ran alongside the, the road. Simon was knocked out as he was thrown into a haystack. He awoke to hear crying and knew that it was his grandpa and grandma. He got up, ran over, and found them in the trench. The truck was totaled. Simon climbed into the ditch to help them. Both of them had arms that were broken, with pieces of bone that pierced the flesh. To Simon's surprise, they were alive, but the smell of gas that filled the air alarmed him. He was near a pasture with little chance of being spotted. If he stayed and waited, they would die. If he decided to get help, it would be the reapers to respond, and that would be the end. If he decided not to get help, he could get in trouble with the law if anybody found out about what he had done. Not knowing what to do, he panicked and decided to run to his house, as he had heard the sound of a big balloon behind him, which permeated the air. Simon turned around to see a thick plume of black smoke rising against the evening sky. Asked Quickblade. Then the remainder of the people looked at one another, as if unsure of what to do next. I could tell from their downcast faces that many were not thrilled about what was going to happen to Coach, but dare not to stay to see what would happen next. Even if my teammates began to look less inclined to stay as they watched Simon's departure, some, however, stood as if frozen. <laughs>